ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवया ओम श्री चैतन्य प्रसादेना नयाम फलोपी कुरुते शास्त्र दृष्टि व्रज विलास नहीं ओम पंचकल्पतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पातिथा भावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्री वासादी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे ओम भद्र काले नमो नित्यम सरस्वते नमो नम वीरवे रंगा विद्या वेलकम एवरी वन वेलकम डियर डबी Very good. Welcome back to our Wednesday classes. Um, I know we haven't had class for the past couple of times, and other times we were catching up on our Gita study. Um, so we haven't had time to go back and revisit Nectar of Instruction. This is very exciting. Um, going one back once again at this text. We are at first four of this text. of Srila Rupa Goswami, the great Vaishnava saint, um, disciple of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who has written an introductory kind of sutra text on the practice of Vaidhi Bhakti, the practice of the rules and regulations of devotional service, um, the practical um, everyday Um, pitfalls and essentials and the various type of things. These are the kind of texts that we're going to be covering in these Wednesday classes. And so we have heard several verses, just quickly as to you know what what kinds of things we're hearing about, because we're already kind of coming up on halfway through. So Rupa begins by. Telling us a sober person who can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands, the actions of anger, and the urges of the tongue, belly, and genitals is qualified to make disciples all over the world. So this is this first in first verse pertains especially to this um, upadesha, this instruction. This is called the upadesha amrita, the nectar of instruction. And so it starts out with qualifications for one who um, is. Qualifications for one who, who um, that we should accept instructing us, um, which is why we are, you know, you're not taking instruction from Yoga Maya. <laughs> you're not taking. I certainly haven't mastered any of these, things. but um, we're taking instruction from Bhaktivedanta Swami. We're taking instruction from Rupa Goswami himself. We are taking instruction from so many advanced Vaishnavas here in this class. And so it begins with. Hearing from someone who has these qualifications, these certain qualifications, it goes into some do's and don'ts. And so um, there's some don'ts, and we usually think of these rules and regulations of Vaidhi Bhakti in terms of the don't. Um, but actually, in Rupa's text, it focuses overwhelmingly on the do's. This is what you should do. This is what the life of a devotee looks like. And so we we get some don'ts at the beginning. It says one's devotional service is spoiled when he becomes too entangled in the following six activities: eating more than necessary or collecting more funds than required, over endeavoring for mundane things that are very difficult to obtain, talking unnecessarily about mundane sub subject matters, prajampa. Remember, remember this word. Practicing the scriptural rules and regulations only for the sake of following them and not for the sake of spiritual advancement, or rejecting the rules and regulations and working independently or whimsically. Right, you have too strict adherence to the rules, too much emphasis on the rules, and then too little emphasis. On the rules. Um, we tend to think that we have this this uh, um, notion that oh, bhakti is 
um, bhakti is an easier path, and so there are less there's less strictness, and this is true to a great extent. This is true. It's not as aesthetic a path. There are more householders on this path, you know, etc. But people, you know, kind of take bhakti very cheaply. Like, you know, I call it music festival bhakti. <laughs> not that there's anything. If any of you go to bhakti fest, don't at me. I don't want any messages. I don't want any angry emails. <laughs> so far, I haven't gotten any, any angry emails. Um, but um, this is can be you know, independently or whimsically. Um, taking to this process of bhakti. Um, bhakti, yeah, it is the hardest. Um, it's easy, but it's hard. You know, very, it's easier said than done, right? But um, I think that what we mean by bhakti is the easiest, is that bhakti is the most accessible path, and that is a, is a path that anyone can do. One doesn't have to be an aesthetic, one doesn't have to be in any sort of varna, or any sort of ashram to practice bhakti, anyone, regardless of their situation. Yes, and this, um, this, oh, I, um, there was a, this discussion reminds me, there was a Swami who was speaking this weekend at my temple, who is um, about this dynamic of, um, it's hard to open our heart, right? So I'm sure you've all seen this painting. Did Michelangelo have a god come black? I'm not sure. But the, the many of you have seen this painting, right? I saw this painting recently when I was in Italy, right? And so the Swami who's coming, Swami Padmanabha Maharaj, points out that God is taking over, right? God is giving the life to, to Adam in this picture, in the biblical story. This is a painting on the scene of the um, ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And God is leaning and reaching and doing everything he can to reach Adam. And Adam is kind of leaning the other way, right? He's kind of lounging, right? Um, we, God is all in on us. And we are just trying to reciprocate with that or failing to reciprocate with that in most cases. Um, God already, it, it, the, this whole bhakti process, Vaidhi, um, going into Raganuga, as our as the as the saints have told us, um, it's all about reciprocating with Krishna's embrace. Krishna is embracing us all the time. We just don't know. We don't know. We don't see. And in order to cultivate that vision, we um, have these things prescribed by um, for our Oma Jnana Tirannasya Jnana Dina Shalakaya Chakshuru Militam Yena Tosmei Shri Guru Venaha. Um, this verse from Sandhu Purana, the Guru, Guru Gita, their famous verse. Um, it's given often as like there, I was in darkness and my Guru and the teachings have opened my vision with a torch of light. Actually, it's more of um, my eyes are sickly. I, I forget exactly the word, but I, my diseased eyes have been smoothed by ointment, by medicine that has been put on by my Guru. And so um, we all have the disease of material conditioning and our Dr. Rupa Goswami, Srila Rupa Goswami, is uh, giving us a very nice prescription of enthusiasm, endeavoring with confidence, being patient, acting according to the regulative principles such as Shravanam Kirtanam, hearing chanting and remembering Krishna, abandoning the association of non-devotees, we already talked about that, um, about um, the danger of evil company and of a company that deflates one's devotion. Um, someone doesn't have to be a devotee in order to be beneficial for one's devotion. Um, similarly, one can be a devotee and one might, you know, totally bum you out every time. <laughs> I know there are some devotees, but like when I, um, you know, like not in my temple community, but when I go other places, Oh, this person's empty, or this person I don't like this place, you know. And we should we should get along with everyone and we serve everyone, right? But if there's someone who doesn't, you know, this also may mean, you know, this can mean a lot of things, then this person is not the way. Um asangatyagat. Um sangatyagat, renunciation of sangha with um with unlike minded people. And following in the footsteps of previous acharyas, these six principles undoubtedly assure complete success in devotional service. Now we come to our text for today. 
Tadati pratigri nanate buyam akyati pratchati Unkse ho jate chai ho dayate chaiva sad itam priti lakshana. So he says, Dadati offering gifts in charity and pratigrahati, pratigrahati, granati, pratigrahati, accepting charitable gifts oneself. These are the first two. Revealing one's mind and confidence, guya akyati. Inquiring confidentially. Accepting prasad, we'll talk about what prasad is in a moment, and offering prasad. These are six symptoms, lakshanam, of love shared by one devotee another. Lakshanam is the same word when we have the nava lakshana bhakti, the nine processes of devotional service. So Shavanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu Smaranam, Padaseva Nam, Atmani Devanam, all of these um, that we talked about in in the lecture on the previous lectures on the previous verse. And so in our commentary, Prabhupada says, even in order, ordinary social activities, these six types of dealings between loving friends are absolutely necessary. For instance, when one businessman wishes to contact another businessman, he arranges a feast in a hotel and over, and over the feast openly expresses what he wishes to do. He then inquires from his business friend how he should act, and sometimes presents are exchanged. Thus, wherever there is a dealing or priti or love and intimate dealings, the six activities are executed. In the previous verse, Sri Rupa Goswami advised that one should renounce worldly association and keep company with the devotees. Sangat Yagat Sato Vritihe. The International Society of Con Krishna Consciousness has been established to facilitate these six kinds of loving exchanges between devotees. So I think we can take this. Um, this is a very immediately applicable verse to our lives. Um, the um, that these things, these exchanges in our dealings are meant to be especially sacred. Our, all of our dealings are meant to be sacred as devotees, but giving and receiving um, asking questions confidentially and um, giving advice and accepting prasadam sacred food, and offering sacred food. And so these are different exchanges that meeting happen in the, um, in the life of a devotee. And we're going to look today, we're not going to go so much through Prabhupada's purport. It's a lot of stuff we've heard before. But I, so I wanted to do a little bit of kata, a little bit of storytelling about some devotees who have um, had famous stories of these types of exchanges, often involving um, the Lord himself. Pretty much all of these, or most of them, are stories from the Bhagavatam, um, which is a text that I think gives a really good um, and thorough picture um, analysis, if you will, of interactions between devotees, at, both devotees and God and his devotees. There are many other Puranic texts that tell many of these same stories. Uh, the Vishnu Purana is one of them, the Padma Purana, this, this whole literature of Puranas in which the Bhagavatam is coming. It is all these stories of different leelas of the of the Lord and his various incarnations. And in most, they focus on just that. They focus on the Lord. They focus on his form. They focus on the circumstances of the incarnation. And this is true of the Bhagavatam. But the Bhagavatam focuses especially on the perspective of the devotee, especially on the perspective of the person worshiping God and what they are getting from the experience. And so the Bhagavatam is a treasure trove of models for how we should interact as devotees. And when we're talking about these devotees' interaction, these interactions, these different types of interactions that devotees have, these stories immediately come up. 
So I'd like to share them with you. Some of them you are definitely familiar with, or probably are familiar with, like this one um, that we're about to go into. Some of them are not, not so much maybe, um, but we will see. Thank you for indulging me. And I hope that we as sit back to enjoy some, some story time. So for these first two verses about giving and receiving, Sana is the word in Sanskrit. Sana is a word that means charity. It means giving. And giving in Hindu culture is considered a very important um, principle. The entire old Vedic society was based on a principle of giving and receiving in the form of the sacrifice, in the form of the Vedic fire sacrifice. And so the things would be offered to the gods into the flame of the sacrificial fire. Agni, the mouth of the god, right, eats up all the offerings and all of the devas get their, um, they use those offerings to make their amrita or whatever they're drinking. And then they um, bless us with rain and cows and charity. And it's this cosmic rhythm of sacrifice and reciprocation that keeps the universe in balance in this Vedic paradigm. And a lot of the stories in the Puranas play with this Vedic idea of sacrifice and pass it in a theistic light. And I think one of the stories that, that does that is a story that comes in the eighth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam about Vamana. Vamana literally means dwarf. And it is one of the many stories that involved a war between the gods and the demons. We've talked about this motif in our Saturday classes, particularly in our um, the second Krishna class that we did, Introduction to the Puranic World. We talked about this concept of the, um, the, the gods and the demons are duking it out in the cosmos, and when the demons are on top and the gods are banished, from their um, from their abode, then the Lord comes to restore dharma. And so, with regard to giving and receiving, in one of these instances, the um, the universes are taken over by a demon king named Maharaj Bali. And now Bali is different than other demons. Like we think about demons like Ravana, think of demons like Kutana, we think of demons like Mahishasura. We think of demons aren't nice characters. But Bali is the grandson of Prahlad. You'll remember Prahlad from our Nashringa Dev Kapidasa class. And so he has some very virtuous DNA, virtuous lineage. And so Bali isn't really a bad guy. He's just very proud. And he wants power. And he wants to own everything. And so he very easily takes over the world. He first tries during the churning of the ocean of milk, he tries to steal the nectar from the god. That doesn't work. And he is, you know, he's killed in that story. And he's brought back to life by his guru, Shukracharya, who is the guru of the demons. Even the demons have a guru um, in this story. And he's sort of an anti-guru, right? They're, they're, all the gurus in the Bhagavatam are telling, oh, you renounce the world, um, devote yourself to God, devote yourself to prayer. Um, everything in the world belongs to God, nothing belongs to you. Um, but the, um, the demon guru speaks the opposite. The demon guru says, like, build a nice house for you. Build um, a nice wealth for your family. That's what really matters. To God. You know, <laughs> like, these, sort of, these sort of things that we get taught at college. You know? <laughs> um, and so these are the things the anti-guru, Shukracharya, is teaching, the demonic guru. And so Bali has taken over. And there, um, and so the Lord agrees to be born in a form where he will disturb the sacrifice of Maharaj Bali. Bali is performing this um, Ashvameda Yagya, this sacrifice that is performed to conquer the world, to gain control of all of the three worlds, um, or the entire earth can be performed by this Ashvameda sacrifice. And I think he performed, he performed something like 99 Ashramita sacrifices. And I think this is like the last one that he needs to do in order to like completely take over the world. And so Bali is very opulent. He has everything. So there's all of these Brahm, all of the sages in the universe, the demigods, like that are jested, right, are watching 
you know, but all of the demons are there, all of the Saptarishis, all of the guardians of the directions are there, the whole universe is there at this second. And in walks this little boy, this little dwarf boy, not, not just a dwarf, a dwarf child, um, freshly endowed with his sacred thread ceremony that happens when you have eight to ten. And he strides in with his little water pot and his little umbrella. And he bows to everyone and he takes his tea and everyone is so charmed. And Bali says, Brahman, you have come here on your begging round. You are coming to beg. So this is what Brahmins do. Brahmins come to beg charity from the, um, the sacrifice of the king, and the king is obligated to give them some. This is why Sita has to open the door for Ravana, because Ravana is described the disguise as a Brahmin. She must give something. And so Bali says, what do you want, little boy? You're so charming. You're so beautiful. I can give you anything in the world. And Bali says, oh, I just only wish for three steps of land. And but measured by my step. I don't need anything. I don't need anything. But Bali's like, are you sure? I can give you anything. I can give you um I can give you a planet if you want. I can give you a kingdom. I can give you weapons. I can give you immortality, like the nectar of immortality. Um, I can bestow upon you um all of these things. Probably not immortality. Even the gods can't give up immortality. But I can give you literally anything, and you just ask for these three steps. And there's a famous line where Bali Maharaj says that I must ask for three steps of land, which is basically enough to, like, you know, one, two, three, basically. And not barely enough to lie down, right? But he says if, you, if a person is not satisfied with three steps of land, there is nothing in the whole world that can satisfy if he's not satisfied with just the bare necessities of life. There's a famous verse in Sukhidev that says in the Bhagavatam, are there no you know, trees to give shelter that, that we can sleep under? No. The Lord is providing everything. Right? Foxes have holes and, the, and, and dens, um, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, as Jesus says. And so he says, I only beg for these three steps of life. And Shukracharya recognizes this is an incarnation of Vishnu. He is going to become the universal form and he's going to traverse the universe with his step. And you are going to be finished, Bali Maharaj. But Bali Maharaj is, is very true to his word. That's one characteristic about him. He is very, um, he is torn at this point between. He knows he's probably going to lose everything. But can he bring himself to go back on his word? And the decision we make, as we all know, is that, is that he um, assents to this. And, he, and in, instantly, Lama Dadev grows to this huge size. And in one step, he covers the, all of the earth and all of the sky. They're in the um, they're in the Patal, Patalaloka. They're in the um, demon realm right now. So his foot goes all the way up past the earth, and then his next stride it goes all the way up to Brahmaloka, all the way up to the edge of the universe. There is nowhere in the universe left for him to put his third step. And so still, and so it, it describes that it is. Bali Maharaj sees that the whole universe is within the navel of Vamanadev. There's like that famous story of Krishna when he eats dirt, right? And Mother Yashoda looks at himself and sees the whole universe. This is the Virat Rupa Darshan, same as we have in the Gita. And Bali Maharaj tells Vamanadev, knowing that he is finished, that he is done, he says, my, my Lord, you have shown your prowess, and the only place I can offer you a suitable place for your third step, please put your foot on my head. And so here we get this famous image 
of Vamana Dev giving Bali the mercy. Um, um, and with it, which may look like a kind of pushing him down, but, but actually to take the feet of the Lord on one's head is a very opposite. The feet of the Lord is where the mercy of the Lord is. And not, and just, and, and even though Bali is banished to the lower planet, he is given a ruling position from which he serves the Supreme Personality of God, thus fulfilling his, his desire. And so in this story, we see a lot about giving, about what it means to give, specifically about who owns everything. When we give, we shouldn't think that, oh, I am giving. Bali had possessiveness with what he was giving. He was magnanimous. He wanted to give. He was almost a philanthropist. He was giving to everybody who came. He was like, you get a car, and you get a car. He was giving and giving and giving. But he had this material motive. Similarly, when um, I'm not to Bali Maharaj is a great devotee, I don't want him to accuse me accuse me of comparing him to this, but it's like when televangelists say, like, oh, you know, exploiting people's tendencies, and they give and give and give, and he's giving money to a holy person, right? There should be merit included when you give money to a holy person. But if you give money to the televangelist, they're preying on your um, material desire. God's going to bless me with a house. God's going to bless me with a house. Right? As if God owes you any of those things. And so Bali didn't realize that everything in the world only belonged to Bali. And so what did he do? He surrendered his full self, Atmani Vedanam, like we talked about. He exemplifies Atmani Vedanam according to our scripture, according to the Vaishnava scripture. Um, this Anga of Bhakti, this, um, this uh, Lakshana of Bhakti is exemplified by Bali Maharaj. Um, and so we have a sense of what we're giving, right? Everything is either God or God, right? And um, there is this, idea, and I love this idea of the story. It's like we have nothing else to give. So it's like when we offer things, we're giving ourselves. When we offer, you know, our incense to Ma on the altar, you're like, Ma, I am giving you myself through this incense, through this flower, through um, these cans of soup stacked on the soup kitchen. You are giving yourself to God in, in those two things. This is the way we give God that, I believe. There's another story about giving that again is very familiar to some of you, and it concerns a friend and playmate of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna had a friend named Sudama, who was a Brahmana. Back in um, his, um, when he was growing up, you know, in, in his home village of, of, of Braj. He was a Brahmin and he was very poor. You know, Raj was a very wealthy area, but some members of the village were very poor. And it was getting very, very desperate. Krishna is a king at this point. You remember when we briefly sketched Krishna's life, there's this period where he is um, in Vrindavan playing with his friends, but he is called away by Akuda um, to go defeat Kamsa and reinstate his uncle, Ugrasena, on the throne, and then he goes to become king of Dwarka. And so meanwhile, while, while Krishna is reigning on the throne, Sudama and his family are languishing in poverty. Sudama's wife one day comes and says, you are friends with Krishna. He, you haven't seen him for years. We have barely enough family and food to feed our family to survive. Go to him. We, we are in desperate need. Go to him. And he says, oh, I can't go empty handed. Now, but, 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 and now we, I, I don't think he even will, will remember. We had so many good times growing up. We, we were schoolmates, we would wrestle in the fields, um, we would play with the cows, we would embrace by the banks of the river, we would laugh, we would joke. Oh, how, what I would give to see my son. He's brimming with this love, with this beautiful affection, but he says, I have nothing to give. I have nothing to give. I, we have lived in this poor house. How am I going to go see a king? In this, um, even if you are um, a commoner, when you make a visit like this, you, call, you go, you give something, right? This is the custom. 
And so the only thing that um, he had to give, I didn't, but, um, and the only thing he has to give is this handful of chipped rice, this flattened rice. Um, we have another story about chipped rice coming up. Again. We told it before, but it's hard to when we talk about Prasada. Um, and so he ties it in this bundle. He sticks it under his arm, this leftover rice, this rice that is like a byproduct of the husking process. That's made into like quick um, okay. porridges. And things. I love chips. I, I I make it all, all the time. <laughs> like you can, you can now nowadays you get it in big bags at the Indian store, right? But it was commoner food, poor man's food at the time. And so Sudama is walking with this under his armpit, this um, bag of chipped rice for Krishna. And when he arrives at the gates, Dorothy is begging to be let in. Please let me in. I'm a friend of Krishna's. And they're like, they're, who are you? Rando person coming to walk up. And he says, like, go, go ask, you know, he's like, Sudama, my name is Sudama. Krishna will know me. Please go tell Krishna. I need to see Krishna. I will I will die if I don't get to see Krishna. He's like, all right, like, my lord, there's some guy named Sudama waiting for the gate. Krishna's being fanned by his <laughs> by his wives, by his queen, being served by his servants, and he was kind of like, oh, Sudama. Sudama's here to see me. He drops everything and he rushes through the gates all the way up to the city gate. And he himself opens the door and hugs his friend um, and embraces him um, and takes him in. And he, he feeds Sudama opulently and he washes his feet. And his wife, and um, Rukmini, who is the goddess of fortune, she's Lakshmi. Right, to the incarnation of, of Lakshmi Devi, the goddess of wealth, the goddess of opulence. Um, they dress him in fine clothes, they garland him, they bathe him, they feed him this opulent food, they bathe his feet, they um they give him the royal treatment. This person who is very almost beggarly person, they give um this this worship, this royal treatment. And so Sudama is overwhelmed. He's weeping <laughs> this whole time. All of these memories, all of this love, this pure prema is flooding. And he cannot even think of asking for anything. He's just so blissed out. He's so absorbed in love. But Krishna looks at him and says, I think you have something here. But Sudama says, oh, no, no. I, I, I was going to bring something, but lost on the way. I'm so sorry. I should have brought something. And Krishna says, no, you have something. Let me see it. And he reaches and he grabs this bag of sweaty armpit rice. And he looks and he goes, ah, thank you. Chipped rice is my favorite. And Lord Krishna starts stuffing himself. And Ravini comes up and says, no, no, no. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Krishna knocks it out of his hand. And Krishna goes down on the floor and picks up the individual grains of rice and puts it in his mouth. And he eats it up. And Sudama, they, they're talking and they're, um, they reminisce about old times. And the time comes for Sudama to head back. And Sudama thinks, oh, I still need to ask. I still need to ask for um, my needs to be taken care of. But I can't do that. He, he, he's like Swami Vivekananda in that story where he goes to the Kali temple and he can't pray for a solution to his problem anymore. He's too overwhelmed with love. It's like going to the king, going to the king of the universe and asking for a handful of grains. You know, so Krishna dresses him in the royal clothes and sends him on his way. And he doesn't even ask. But what happens is that Sudama comes home and he sees a palace, this huge house that was where his um, little ramshackle hut once was, that has appeared overnight, and now him and his family have adequate food and shelter, this big, beautiful hut. But Sudama says, I must not let this get to my head, so I will build a hut, a kutir for myself, to sleep outside and do my father. And he lives a very simple life towards the end of his life. So, if Bali and Vamana told us about what is being given, 
We are only ever exchanging energies with God. How are those energy exchanges viewed? How, what is the purest way to view that energy exchange? And we see that in this story. Both Krishna and Sudama totally saw past all of the material qualities of the gift. Krishna didn't care about the sweaty, gross, janky, flattened rice of Sudama. And Sudama didn't really care for Krishna's beautiful house. But what made this a beautiful exchange was the love that they have for each other. My Guru Dave likes to say, God eats our love, not our food. Krishna says in the Gita, he, step, he is satisfied with simple things, a fruit, a flower, some water, things that are easily available. And so Krishna and Sudama totally look past the material benefit, the selfish aspect of the gift, and look totally into the other aspect of the gift, even, as, even though as they were receiving it. That's love. That is real love right there. That is real love in its purest form, in my opinion, which is why this is one of my favorite stories. It was a very popular one, very famous one. The thing about inquiring confidentially, um, there, are very, there are many examples of this. Um, approach a spiritual master and inquire submissively of him, says Krishna in the Gita, in order to spiritually advance, in order to begin on the devotional path. And this comes back to the, um, the Sangat Gyagat um, verse. Right, this comes back to the verses about being careful who one has association with. And association, sangha, means a very special thing. So, like Nish says, that you shouldn't tell your spiritual experience, but have one or two friends that are close. It's important to have those one or two friends, other people on the server, people in your church or in your temple community, or um, a colleague um, that you, um, in a spiritual colleague, I mean, like a guru brother, um, not one of your work colleagues. <laughs> um, uh, talking about your work colleagues, colleagues about your son, no. um, I don't know about that. But the, um, but there is this idea that um, my my um, temple president and my ISKCON center like to say is that we make our own ISKCON. Where there are all, all these people coming to us in the name of this Khan, in the name of chanting Hare Krishna, in the name of the holy name, but not all of them, maybe, are, um, we're going to have this deep emotional connection. And that's fine. We respect everyone. We serve everyone. But there are certain people who we can really hash out these life things with. And um, Bhakti is not something that we do alone. It comes from sharing. Bhaj from which we get bhakti and bhajan and all of these words, these things that we're trying to do, it all means giving. Sharing is what bhaji. And so not, not only sharing our, um, our, our worries, our struggles, but also sharing our thoughts, sharing our perspective, sharing our experience um, in order to reciprocate with this person's honest interest. And the chief example of this, I think, that we'll all be familiar with is Krishna and Arjuna. When Krishna is inquiring on the battlefield, um, and we have this conversation that we're still in the midst of going through on our Saturday class. And I wanted to point to this previous story that we've gone over, where Krishna, where Arjuna and Duryodhana go to Krishna and says, whose side are you going to be on, essentially? And Krishna offers, I can offer one of you power, my armies, my weapons, or I could offer you my counsel. And Arjuna rejects the weapons, rejects the material advantage for the spiritual counsel. This is a demonstration of the value of this confidential inquiry. Guhya is the word. Guhya means hidden. It means secret. Guhya kata, secret talk, is the way that Sri Ramakrishna used to refer to some of the more esoteric discourses that you'd have with his disciples like Anne and Swami Vivekananda and uh, Rakal in the Katamrita. And 
so it's a confidential and and that is what the Bhagavad Gita is, the most confidential knowledge that chapter is given, right? Um, and so this is a demonstration of the value that it is worth giving up the whole world of material advantage for advice that is spiritually fulfilled. And then also in one thing I've been contemplating about inquiring confidentiality is that it involves on both parties a measure of vulnerability. We have to get low when we approach someone for help whether or not that person is our superior, quote unquote, or our um, one of the people we are taking care of. One of the people, a younger person, maybe, is giving you advice. There's um, a great example of this in the third canto of the Bhagavatam, um, where um, the third canto of the Bhagavatam, where um, there, it talks about a progenitor of the universe named Kadarma, one of the uh, Prajapati, one of the um, the sages that populate the universe. And Kadarma has married a beautiful um, aristocratic lady, um, daughter of one of the Manus, I believe, um, named uh, Devahuti. And Devahuti is a real princess. And she is very um, attached to her husband. She loves him very much. She serves him very, very diligently. And she bears him many children. And she has lots of desires. She asks for a house and all of these. And Kadarma, being the good husband that he is, provides that he builds her like an, an air house in the clouds. Like we talk about like the Barbie movie. Think of Barbie. <laughs> like, like, sorry, my mind is thinking in Barbie movie these past two weeks, but like this like mansion in the sky, and he like um, it might be too explicit, but like he um, has, like multiplies himself so he can like have this like crazy like crazy good sex with David who sees like lifestyles of the rich and famous. She lives this, this huge opulent life, having this great sex great food, great everything. She's bearing all these children. Like she's having this beautiful life. And then Kadarma takes Sanyat. He goes off and says, I because he's because she is very into this family life thing. Kadarma's kind of attached, unattached. And so he um and so Kadarma leaves. And after this Devahuti is in lamentation. She says, what should I do? My life now. What is the purpose of my life now that I no longer have a husband? But in the meantime, she has given birth to one of her sons named Kapila, who you may know as the propounder of Sankhya philosophy. Sankhya is the philosophy of distinguishing spirit from matter. And so Devahuti, knowing that her son is also a great sage, she goes to her own son and says, I am so unfulfilled in life. Can you please help me? Imagine. Isn't this what we as like spiritual practitioners imagine all of our parents doing? I don't know if it's just me, but like, like if we have parents who are like, who are um, like, or like imagine our friends, it's just like, it's like if any of you have been like um, evangelical Christian and like you have that fantasy of like one day one of my friends is going to ask me about Jesus and they're going to say it, right? <laughs> like, you know, it makes me think of that. But Kapila does not interact that way. He says, what a beautiful question. Let me serve you by attempting an answer. And yeah, our parents think we're weird, right? <laughs> like, 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 if we, if our parents asked us about, you know, our church, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, um, but, but, and he instructs her on this Samkhya philosophy, on um, the difference between the spiritual world and the material world, instructing on the principles of devotional service, the Kapila Gita. Um, is a text that we will come to when we, um, so this is a total effacing, a total inversion of the social role that we'll get to when we come to Bhagavatam, which is the power of this confidential asking, that it, the, that these personal interactions can sort of upend our preconceptions of relationships, and we can get advice in some of the um, most upside down places. 
And of course, I think the ultimate example of this is King Parikshit of the of uh, the main interlocutor of the Bhagavatam, who, through um, a fault of his own, is condemned to die in seven days. There he's one King Parikshit is wandering through the forest hunting, and he comes upon a sage who's meditating. King Perch is very thirsty and he says, Oh, Sage, please get me some water. But the Sage does not hear him using Samadhi. And Perch is angered and he takes a dead snake, something very impure, and he loops it around Perch's neck, uh, around the Sage's neck, and leaves. And the Sage is not bothered by this, but his son sees it and is very, very upset. And so his son casts off. Um, you know, he touches water and he curses whoever puts this snake around my father's neck is going to die within the next seven days. And so Pariksit, when he hears this, he doesn't try to counteract this place. He doesn't try to resist. In some versions, he does. But in the Bhagavatam, he doesn't. Um, and so he goes to a secluded place in the forest with a bunch of sages and begins to inquire about the purpose of life. If I'm going to die in seven days, what should I spend my time doing? And this say, and this wandering teenager comes in. He has dreadlocks. He's completely naked. He wanders through the forest. He's surrounded by this group of forest-dwelling people and animals who follow him around. He's this simple, simple soul. This is Sukade, who has been taught the Bhagavatam from his father, Vyasa, and who is going to be the main interlocutor with Pariksha amongst the un, um, amidst the unfolding of these Bhagavatam stories. And so you have this king, this on top, this person on the top of society who's falling at the feet of this homeless person, of this homeless 16 year old, listening to him without eating, without sleeping, <laughs> right? Whoops, sorry without eating, without sleeping, for seven days, listening to the Bible. This is what we mean by confidential hearing, confidential action. This, this, what, what's this? Ah, uh, you can't hear me? Oh dear, okay. This, um, I think how this headphones should be picking it up. Um, the, um, okay, okay, um, then we'll probably show it fine in the recording. Um, so this is what is meant by confidential hearing. This is radically personal, um, confidential inquiry. And these last verses, I don't know if we'll, how we can, these last verses are about prasada, are about food. Um, which is a topic that we all really love. Um, I hope I have some. <laughs> like, um, and, but, and of course, this is, any of you who have been to a Hindu temple, this means things that have been offered to the deities, I know, looks delish, right? Um, and this is considered non-different from the deity. This is food that has been put on the altar. And mantras are said to the deity eats our food, that we make it out of love. And there are certain rules um, for prasada that um, it, it has to be vegetarian, right? it can contain eggs, has to be sattvic, can't be onion or garlic. There are various reasons for this. And prasada is a big part of Vaishnav culture. Um, literally, the words that are um, said in the in Rupa Goswami verse is eating and giving of food. And so the, the exchange of prasadam is regarded as exchanging um, Krishna himself in the form of food. So the mercy of Krishna is so great that he lets us feed him and he offers us, and so he, the idea is he takes the subtle body of the food and replaces it in his eating with his own shakti with his own potency, with his own energy. And so this food is, in a sense, shaktified. And even though we eat it, and we you know, may not feel ecstasy, you know, we, depending, depending on what it is, we may be feeling some ecstasy. 
<laughs> if I ate this meal right now, I would be in bliss. I would be in samadhi. <laughs> For sure. I'm sure all of us would. But that enjoyment gets to be dovetailed onto Krishna. Now we are in we eat for Krishna, not for ourselves. And this prasadam is regarded as non-different from Krishna himself. And so there's a there's a text in this in the Chaitanya Charitamrita where Lord Chaitanya is at the Jagannath festival, the Jagannath temple. Um, this temple that is famous for its prasad, we've talked, we've all talked about the Jagannath temple before. And so this is an incident that is described by Raghunath Dasaswami, who is um, someone we will come to um, in the culmination of this prasad section. And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes to the temple and he says, my dear friend, the doorkeeper, where is Krishna, the Lord of my heart? Kindly show him to me quickly. With these words, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu addressed the doorkeeper like a madman. The doorkeeper grasped his hand and replied very hastily, Come, see your beloved. May that Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu rise within my heart and thus make me mad. Make us mad, just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is mad. The offering of food is known as Gopala Vallabha Bhoga. The offering of food known as Gopala Vallabha Bhoga. This is the bhoga, the enjoyment of the, of the Gopala Vallabha, the beloved Gopala. That was given to Lord Jagannath, and Arati was performed with the sound of the conch and the ringing of bells. When the Arati finished, the prasadam was taken out, and the servants of Lord Jagannath came to offer some to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The servants of Lord Jagannath first bowed the garland to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and then offered him Lord Jagannath's prasadam. The prasadam was so nice that its aroma alone, to say nothing of its taste, would drive the mind mad. The prasadam was made of very valuable ingredients. Therefore, the servant wanted to feed Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu a portion of it. Mahaprabhu tasted a portion of the prasadam. Govinda, his servant, took the rest and bound it at the end of his jacket at the swap. To Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the prasadam tasted millions upon millions times better than nectar, and he was fully satisfied. The hair all over his body stood on end, and incessant tears flowed from his eyes. He considered, where has such a taste in this prasadam come from? Certainly it was due to being touched by the nectar of Krishna's lips. Understanding that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu felt emotion from ecstatic love of Krishna, but upon seeing the servants of Lord Jagannath, he restrained himself. The Lord said again and again, only by great fortune may one come by a particle of the remnants of food offered to the Lord. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, the, the, these are remnants of food that Krishna has eaten and thus turned to nectar with his lips. It surpasses heavenly nectar. Even such demigods as Lord Brahma find it difficult to obtain. Remnants left by Krishna, and Krishna are called Vela. Anyone who obtains even a small portion of it must be considered very fortunate. Only one who is ordinarily fortunate cannot obtain such mercy. Only persons who have full mercy of Krishna can receive such remnants. The word Sukriti refers to the pious activities performed by the mercy of Krishna. One who is fortunate enough to obtain such mercy receives the remnants of the Lord's food and thus becomes glorious. After saying this, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu bade farewell to all of his servants. After seeing the next offering of food to Lord Jagannath, known as Upala Boga, he would next return to his own portal. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has this great reverence for Prasadam. And there's a story that we won't get to tonight. I'm going to tell it first thing on um, next Wednesday. Um, it, it'll be a reading from this book, um, Sri Chaitanya Mangal, and it'll be running a little long time. But I wanted to kind of finish this verse off real quick. Um, but there's a story where um, Narada has come from Vaikuntha to um, to give uh, to from taking the remnants of Lord Narayan of Krishna Prasadam. And he visits Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva says, "I can tell you have Krishna Prasadam." Um, do you have any? Oh, I would give anything for a, a tiny morsel of Lord Krishna's prasadam. And there's one crumb, there's a tiny crumb left that's placed on the tongue of Lord Shiva. And he goes into ecstasy and he starts dancing. And he dances so hard that 
it heats up the universe. And so um, Parvati has to calm him down. Um, but I would like to conclude by telling this story of Raghunath Das Goswami um, that we've told before. Um, and it's of the Chiha Dadi Mahotsa, the Chip Rice Festival, the story of Lord Chaitanya, where there is a young son of a billionaire, Raghunath Das Goswami, who keeps trying to run away and join the Hari Krishna, run away and join the devotee. And Sri Chaitanya tells him, don't come back and uh, try to run away from me. Just go back and, and do um, errands for your family, work for your family. And when the time comes, you will be able to come visit. And so Raghunath Swami later on comes upon Nityananda after living in separation from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he comes upon Nityananda, who is giving a, a lecture to his disciples, to his disciples. And Raghunath Das Goswami is feeling unworthy of being in the presence of Nityananda, so he pays obeisances from the distance. And Nityananda calls to him, Raghunath, come over here. And Raghunath is brought over by the disciples. Nityananda says, there is a thief in our midst. You have thought to deprive us of your association by staying over there, and I must punish you. And your punishment is to make a feast out of chipped rice and yogurt, out of the simple food, and feed it to all of the Vaishnavas, all my disciples here. And so Raghunatha buys food from all of these local vendors, sweet food, savory food, and he puts it in these pots, and he goes around over and over again serving the devotees. So prasad, what prasad means, prasad means mercy. And so we receive prasad in all kinds of ways. Yes, this verse is talking about food, but all of these interactions, this confidential hearing and confidential advice giving, this um, gift giving and gift receiving, all of these loving exchanges with the devotees are a form of exchanging with Krishna, are a form of prasad. And so what Nityananda was doing by giving this quote unquote punishment is that now you must give your mercy you will be the conduit of Krishna's mercy for all of these people. Because Krishna doesn't give mercy directly. Krishna gives mercy in the form of his devotees. Kali gives mercy in the form of Sri Ramakrishna. Adonai gives mercy in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? God gives mercy. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in this instance, is giving mercy to Raghunath through Nityananda, and Nityananda is giving mercy to everyone else through Raghunath. And so this is the devotional exchange. We are all in this, I can think of this, this festival. It's had a lot of its sun temples. It's something that happens a lot on um, in Hindu temples. It's Pushpa Abhishek. Where the deity is, the, the Abhishek means the flower bath. And so these pushpa, these flowers, are rained onto the deity. And it's so beautiful. The um, flowers start to get tossed back on the crowd, and you're throwing flowers at each other. And at first I thought, oh, this is just fun. It's fun to throw flowers at each other. But no, we're showering each other with blessing. We're showering each other with mercy. We're showering each other with prasad. We're showering each other with love. And so I think I want to conclude by encouraging you all to go shower someone with love today. Um, we are all in the process of giving mercy and receiving mercy. And it is such a, and, th and this is the cornerstone, one of the cornerstones of our devotion. And so um, what things that will be elaborated in these subsequent verses are exactly how this mercy is given and how it is received. How are these relationships with the devotees manifest? That is, I believe, what we are going to be looking at next on the, next time on the next of instruction. Until then, Om Bancha Kopatu Yacha, Kripatu Yuja Evata, Patitanam Pavani Bio, Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha. And that's the Vaishnavi Vindikija.